All right. So uh, thank you for coming. Um, before I start, uh, I wanted to kind of get a sense as to who saw Stefano's Dom Zero less talk yesterday? No one? OK. And who saw, who saw Kate Stewart's talk about uh, certification earlier? Uh, OK, that's almost everyone. Um, so let me just uh, introduce myself. Um, so my name is, uh, is Lars Kurt. I'm the community manager for the Xen project. I'm also the chairman of the Xen project advisory board. I happen to work for Citrix, but Citrix has no real stake in safety and an embedded. Um, I'm primarily working on this, you know, with my with my open source community hat on. Um, and we're basically going to talk about uh, kind of how. Xen is actually becoming relevant in Embedded, and so a bit of, bit of the history, where we're going, and, um, and how we're approaching uh, safety certification. So let's just start why, why actually virtualize Embedded systems all together. And you know, in many ways, it's quite similar to, to why we do this in servers. It's, Consolidation at the end of the day, um, but you know, for slightly different reasons. <clears throat> and there's also an element of reducing development costs, partially as well, because you can take some of your existing applications and run them, you know, within a guest of a hypervisor, which means you get more flexibility um, as you would have had before. Um, another important aspect is security and safety. So uh, one of our goals, uh, and this is why we're doing a lot of the work around safety and also the building blocks leading towards it, is to support mixed criticality compositions. And it really means that you know, we will have applications with different safety, security, and maybe real-time requirements running on the same um, maybe ECU or you know, um, 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 platform. And to be able to do that, Really, we, need, we ultimately, ultimately need to have safety certification in a hypervisor. But also, if you have that, um, it extends the number of use cases we can ultimately support. And there's a number of embedded requirements, which ultimately you know, we, we have to support. So how do we actually get there from the Xen project's perspective? So let's talk very briefly about a little bit of history. So Xen originally came from server virtualization and cloud computing. Um, what is interesting, and actually this was happened about nine, ten years ago, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, DOD, D, um, US DOD, created a family of uh, Xen-based hypervisors called the Xenon Hypervisor family, which was actually a first time where they tried formal methods on the Xen code base um, towards common criteria EAL5, including usage of some formal methods. So that's kind of interesting, because this was some of the early work which others then also started building upon from a safety certification perspective. Then um, <clears throat> we had various attempts to bring uh, Xen um, to the desktop, as well as mobile virtualization. So, you know, Linux desktop, <laughs> anyone similar with Xen, we never really kind of crack that. Um, however, you know, Cubes OS as a security conscious operating system is still, is, is around and very successful, as well as OpenXT and SecureView, which again are basically defense applications. Um, and from that baseline, the project eventually um, uh, started branching out into more generic em uh, embedded use cases as well as automotive. And we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail. So uh, the, first, the, the first attempt to bring Xen to embedded devices was started around 2012 by DernerWorks. There's a number of uh, different, uh, there were a number of research grants which enabled them to do this at this time. In fact, uh, there was a specific research project um, which was government funded, which led to the creation, which was looked at the problem of whether it's possible to safety certify a spin off of Xen um, uh, towards DO 178 
level A, and I will quote some of that information from there because that's kind of relevant to that overall discussion. Um, <clears throat> later on, um, DernerWorks created a spin-off um, of that, uh, of, of a, a next generation product called Virtuosity OA, which is basically um, phase certified. So that's future airborne capability environment, and it's a collection of different safety and architectural standards. Um, in 2016, we had a company called we have a company called Starlab. They're doing something similar, but there's less known about them. Um, we then, uh, 2015, Xilinx started getting involved um, with Xen. Um, so, Xilinx actually was the first Xen-based distro for embedded uh, um, uh, devices for their platform, and they have a lot of additional functionality on. Uh, on, on top of the open source Xen. There's currently no safety certification support for that, but it's all something we're working together with Xilinx quite closely. Then we had the first attempts um, to bring Xen uh, to, uh, to automotive, and this, is, this happened around 2015 with, uh, with Global Logic. Um, they're, 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 so, so they just turn up at one of our developer events with a fully fledged demo, you know, showing Android, Android on an ARM board. Um, it was really quite cool at this time. We had no idea as a community this was coming. Um, but the problem ultimately was they were just like too early at that time. You know, there was just like no way that at the time you could reasonably expect um, uh, um, an open source project to be safety certified. So ultimately that effort failed. However, the team at Global Logic ended all up at EPAM and they had a second go at this um, and they have a really interesting platform now. Um, and now we're also at the position and you've probably you know, seen this in, 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 in Kate's earlier talk, we're seeing a lot more of the pieces falling in place to actually make safety certification in an open source context viable. And one of the sort of more interesting things which just has been announced recently is that DernerWorks again has, has, has secured some funding to prepare, uh, to, to work, uh, to work uh, some NASA funding to bring Xen into space. Um, so I don't know that much about it yet, but you know, you can as a link um, towards that. It looks like a very cool, very cool project. To just summarize, um, <clears throat> Actually, one thing I didn't mention was that around 2016, EPAM and Renesas, before they started seriously working on the, um, on the embedded reference, um, embedded Xen reference port, they funded a study uh, by Horiba um, to assess whether it's possible to safety certify a subset of Xen, and the answer for that was clearly yes. And uh, since then, you know, the focus has primarily been on closing functional gaps, adding real-time capability, reducing the code size, and also creating reference, reference implement, implementations for different, for different segments. Um, all of this is open source, but not all of this is upstreamed in Xen at this, at this point. So what has this really meant um, for the project? And how is this really relevant for uh, moving towards, towards safety? So we ended up with a lot of features um, in, 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 in Xen Hypervisor, which are specific to embed it. So we have a number of different schedulers. Um, uh, um, we ended up with a minimal Xen configuration, as driver support, the support for OPT, and a lot of other things. This is just a very, very, very high level list. And the two things which are most relevant for the safety certification effort is the minimal Xen on ARM configuration. So I think we're currently at about 47,000 lines of code, which you know, isn't, is, it, it makes safety certification on top of Xen feasible. And a key critical component of this is DOM zero less Xen. So if you look at the, the traditional Xen system, you have DOM0, which is a special VM, and it typically runs Linux. It could potentially also run an Atos, but that would normally have to be safety certified, and that is obviously a lot of lines of code. So this effort, the DOM0 Xen effort, is driven by 
uh, Xilinx. And as a reference um, to this at the end as well, this will really make it, this is going to be part of our initial safety certification scope. But the upshot of all this is that really, you know, almost accidentally, you know, because um, originally Xenon Arm was really designed for servers, and then through the effort of companies like EPAM and, and Xilinx and others, it actually turned out a great hypervisor for embedded and mixed criticality use cases, and so we have a really good, good baseline to build on. So, um, that brings us, you know, to the topic of, uh, of, of safety certification. So there have been a number of attempts to solve, current attempts to solve this. So there's obviously there's FreeRTOS. Um, FreeRTOS is open source. Um, there's a there's safe RTOS, a proprietary spit rewrite, you know, complying um, uh, with with IEC. But you know, this is not really what we're looking for. There was the SEL uh, SEL2 L Linux MP effort, which then eventually has become you know ELISA, and there's a number of Linux Foundation projects um, which which are also um, having an ambition to become easily certifiable. Um, so one of the things, and this will also become a theme of uh, of this talk to some degree, there's a set of common problems, which you know, which behind the back, these different projects were starting to collaborate on solving some of these. Um, and of course, you know, each of those projects have a different history, culture, and specific problems that have to be overcome in the you know in a context um, of, of of that project. So you know, like. Cepher has a quite different culture to, to Xen from a development perspective. Xen, in many ways, is quite similar to, to, to Linux um, from how we operate, but obviously it's a lot smaller. But functionally, you know, at the end of the day, there's really, if you abstract it down to some core areas, there's two, there's two sets of problems, you know, which, uh, which we have to to solve. So the first realization is that to make the project safety certifiable, you, you have to make some changes and sometimes major changes to the code base. Um, it requires tools, it requires infrastructure and expertise, and all this could potentially be solved by throwing money at it, right? Um, the, however, the, 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 the elephant in the room is, you know, you ultimately need to change how the open source project operates and how the community works. And until relatively recently, nobody, you know, everybody assumed this was just not going to be possible, and so nobody even really tried. And that's why we've seen, you know, past attempts where somebody used the open source code base, forked it, you know, built something or, or rebuilt it, um, and tried and did it this way. Um, however, actually, as we will see a little bit later, maybe this is actually achievable. And the more I think about it, and the more, at least in the context of Xen, we're starting to work with our developers, this become this seems to be uh, a solvable problem. And actually, each individual bit you look at um, uh, isn't entirely new. It's stuff we have solved in some way, shape, or form in a different open source context before. <clears throat> but let's look at some figures. And so these figures actually came, out, came from, uh, from DernerWorks. Um, uh, so the, I'm crediting the sources there. This came out of uh, um, a research grant where they were trying to answer the question whether you could safety certify um, Xen to DO178, which is an avionics standard. Um, up to Dell A, which is the highest certification level. And they really, they, they, they sampled, you know, they, they lo actually looked at a number of components in Xen subsystem and did this. Um, and at the end of the day, came up with, uh, with cost estimates by hour, you know, per line, per line of code. And the key of this is the, these figures really show if you're experienced, if you both know the Xen code base, and you have safety certification expertise, 
you can basically get to the standard by, this, you know, by, by, the, by the number of hours I quoted. If you don't have that expertise, it's going to take significantly longer. The key point really is, because you know, I sort of said earlier, um, uh, there has been already a lot of investment you know, in, um, uh, in that embedded segment um, over the last few years. We're probably looking around 20 to 30, maybe more man years, sort of finger, finger in the air effort. And if you, you know, if you look at those graphs, so we're targeting Del B or Del C you know, there, then you know, to cer safety certify a code base of around 50,000 lines of code, you're somewhere looking you know, in between five and 10 man years. And you know, if you kind of compare this, it's not entirely outlandish really to wanna, to wanna do this. But you know, this at the time was assuming a one-off one effort. And it's also assuming, um, uh, and, and that's actually what we don't wanna, want, don't wanna end up with. We don't wanna end up with a fork you know, where, um, uh, where, where, where somebody takes Xen and safety certifies it. We want to make it easier altogether for everyone building on Xen to achieve that and to really bring this cost down. So, so this has become a, a more of a prominent topic, um, particularly in the last year and a half. Um, uh, and when we started you know, as a project when we started to seriously look at this and experiment with the one or other thing and set up mechanisms um, to, to, to really start that journey. <clears throat> so where's our starting point? So I already pointed out, you know, that we, had, we have examples of Xen-based embedded products. Some have some safety standards. As, as some have some support for safety standards or safety certification packages in, 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 in those products. We have expertise in the ecosystem um, where you know, we have companies who have both Xen and safety expertise. So that's actually a significant advantage because you know, if we, we, we can build on this. Um, we have multiple reference um, implementations. So we have EPAM which has the, uh, an automotive reference stack. We have a Xilinx stack. And um, more recently, you know, DataWorks has announced their, 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 their NASA stack. And there's a similar effort in progress elsewhere, um, which I can't talk about publicly. But, you know, so there's a lot of, so we're already seeing a pattern here around reference implementations. Um, and we also have some adoption in, uh, in in use cases, uh, some of them in a non-safety context, primarily uh, um, in, in, a in, in a military. And we have a few uh, applications, which unfortunately I also can't talk about. Um, so that's the problem with this whole avionics space. There's so much secrecy around it, where, um, uh, where Xen is used in a safety context, but where the safety part can be isolated, you know, on a, on, on, on a different component. So, what, what does this really mean? Uh, and and where, what's our starting point from an architectural viewpoint? So, have a look at, if you're interested, have a look at the slide deck down there. So, or, or you can chat to Stefano, um, who, who put that deck together about um, DOM zero-less um, Xen architecture. So basically the idea here is you have the hypervisor. Um, you, today what we have is you have DOM zero. Um, and normally when you start Xen, you know, Xen starts DOM zero and then DOM zero starts all these other virtual machines and you have a tool stack and everything you know, within your architecture. It's very sort of traditional server focused. But actually what we really want also for low startup latency is the capability to basically start the hypervisor today alongside DOM0 and then, you know, and, and the VMs start off in parallel uh, very quickly. And then from that point on, you know, if something goes wrong, you would just like have a watchdog somewhere in the system and restart it fairly quickly. So this is what we have today. There's a number of restrictions. Most of this is upstream already. And some of it, which isn't, is currently already being posted on a mailing list and hopefully get into the next Xen release towards the end of the year. What we are really working towards is a system where 
there's no DOM zero at all um, in, in the platform. And that would also be our initial, initial safety certification scope. And we'll get there sometimes next, next year by the way how, by the looks of it. So this is our starting point. You know, then, uh, then from there, we could essentially you know, consider um, going to an architecture you know, like, like this, where we basically, in addition to what we've done for true DOM zero less, would have to prove that you know, uh, if, if that non-safety critical side goes down and it doesn't affect the safety critical side, that in theory also looks feasible. And then we have the automotive case, which, you know, as you see, is a lot more is a lot more complex. Um, so this is currently a num the, the the architecture diagram, um, which uh, which EFAM is using. Their common theme is that, that assuming that there's several ECUs in a car. Um, on the left side, um, the, you have an example of where you know one ECU would act as a gateway um, or application server, you know, connecting to the cloud. This would be for things like, this is basically evolution of a telematic control unit for fleet management or user behavior insurance and all these kind of use cases where maybe you want to have workloads coming from, you know, from your cloud being deployed on your car. And then the right example is basically a digital co cockpit, maybe a cluster with IVI or ADES sort of integrated on top of it. But that is ultimately a lot harder um, to do. <clears throat> so, so how, how are we starting to break all the problems from a process perspective down? We set up a, um, a special interest group. We had a big kickoff um, of that at the beginning of this year um, with, uh, with community reps on it. We have a number of uh, safety assessors engaged in this process. And then we have a number of components which actively do work in this area. And then we have um, uh, um, one company which is still sort of sitting a little bit on a fence and observing, and hopefully we'll get them to help actively out with this process as well. And <clears throat> before we started this, we would need, we had to look at we had to look at whether it's actually going to be possible you know, to carry the community along. So at the, very you know, at the beginning of this year, we got safety assessors, companies who had an interest in a driving sense towards, you know, to, to, to make it more safety certifiable, and basically all, all our key community, um, uh, all our key committers, into one room for two days to start basically discussing can this, you know, can this be done? You know, um, uh, so the first day was actually all about trying to build a common understanding. You know, like if, I, if we look at our committer base today, you know, two have a strong embedded background. Um, the, other, the other five, you know, really come from a cloud server virtualization background. And so this was a lot about you know, building common understanding on both sides. Because what was interesting, for example, is all the assessors we had in the room, none of them really understood very much about open source. And then we had some companies, um, such as Arm and others, who already looked at this problem from, from a wider perspective, who really helped, helped facil facilitate and kind of build a common understanding. One thing which I took, which, which was most surprising for me, was actually how little all the assessors really agreed as well on how you would approach you know, this, this problem. Um, and we were trying to establish red lines. You know, we were trying to establish what, as a community, could we agree to and what would we obje object to. You know, what level of change would be acceptable in how we operate and also identify potential barriers which would you know, prevent us from going there. Um, when I agreed to set this up, you know, I, had, I, was, I wasn't really sure how this was going to go. I had no idea you know, whether, whether I would just be screamed out of the room or whether, you know, whether, whether we could come to a consensus. And it was actually really surprising because this, this whole two days ended up really productive. 
Um, uh, um, and it actually showed that put, we could do, you know, in principle we can do this. A lot of it depends on the detail. Um, so the first thing is, is that we, we agreed this can only be done if you follow a split development mo model where some of the things are going to be done in the open and uh, some of it is going to be done you know, in a closed part, which could either be an individual vendor or maybe you know, a consortium of those vendors pooling together. And they could then also potentially act as, you know, um, as the accountable body who's responsible for you know, uh, a safety certified spin-off. We then agreed that everything that is valuable for the wider community should ideally live in the open part. So this means you know, like documentations, tests as much as possible, any of the traceability, automation, infrastructure, all this kind of stuff which generally the project as a whole would benefit from should live in the open. Um, another thing, but this was somewhat controversial and this is, this is an area of friction, is everything which creates code churn, I, you know, if it wasn't open, ideally should live, uh, should, should live in the open, but this may not be perfectly achievable, which we'll see a little bit later. <clears throat> um, we, wanted, we want to minimize the changes to the development workflow. And really, really what this means, you know, right now we have a, we have a very Git-centric, you know, workflow. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, if you look at sort of, say, requirements management tools like doors and stuff today, they don't fit into that you know, Git workflow, right? So you would then have to deal with all these parallel systems and keep off artifacts in, tra in, in step and all these kind of things. So, so one of the red lines is, you know, whatever happens needs to fit into this overall workflow. Otherwise, the changes, you know, which would be required by the community would be too disruptive. And, you know, at this time when we looked at this, we weren't sure whether this is doable or not, right? Um, and another area which was really interesting, um, that was ultimate, ultimately a discussion around s community scalability, right? So if you suddenly, suddenly, you know, we, we have a community, you know, of about 50 people who are active, you know, most of them today um, don't have a safety context. If we suddenly have people, you know, come in which have a safety background, which come, you know, which have a very different mindset, that's obviously going to create friction. So we have to somehow, you know, manage this. Um, uh, um, and also we didn't, we don't want to introduce any significant barriers, you know, for, for existing, for existing contributors. So, you know, when we start doing in, in things initially, we're going to have to ring fence these. There's also scalability questions like, right, uh, so, for example, you know, if we reverse engineer, you know, a lot of the documentation needed for, um, uh, for safety certification, if one of those vendors steps up and does that and it gets upstreamed, who's going to review that? You know, code has to be, you know, or documentation has to be reviewed, you know, to go in. So we have to find a way how to bootstrap this. Uh, but at the other on the other hand, you know, this is a problem, but this is a problem every single open source project which kind of grows has to some degree, right? So, so there's a standard pattern for this. So, um, now I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the examples, some example challenges that we're gonna have to overcome and we're, we're sort of working on. And I'm gonna focus on two major things because they're sort of quite different. And there's also another presentation I gave in, in Tokyo at the AGL summit where I'm kind of looking at that in a little bit more detail. There's a link to that um, at the end. Um, because, you know, this, I'm, I'm just going to show you a snapshot of, of, of two quite different types of problems we're going to have to overcome. So the first has to do with basically the V model, right? So most, um, uh, you know, if you want to follow ISO 26262, you're going to have to follow the V model. And it really means, you know, you have to have requirements, you, you know, you have to break, you have to have this whole hierarchy of different documents, 
um, which are traced to each other, and then on the other side you have to have validation, which tests you know, things at every different level. So how do you fit that you know, into an open source development process? You know, can you actually get community buy-in for this at all? Now, the outcome really is the answer was surprisingly yes. You know, I was totally surprised about this, but um, uh, when you start breaking this down, it isn't actually such, such an unachievable problem. Um, so the first thing to note is that many of the challenges we face, uh, we face there are actually quite similar to try and apply that process to an agile development model, which is actually being done um, in some organizations which do safety certification. It's not easy, but it is doable. So, so let's first look at this and see what um, open source projects kind of, you know, what, what do you have normally today and how do you map this in an open source project on, onto this model? So typically, we, you know, in open source we tend to not do requirements, right? If they do, if they do exist, they happen before stuff gets upstreamed in a project and live somewhere in, a, you know, in, an, in an entity outside of the project. Um, but actually, if you look at it for a code base like Sin, um, uh, you know, which is actually a well-defined, you know, it's a, it's a hypervisor. There's not that much magic stuff you can do with it. Um, retrofitting this, oh, sorry. I'm back. Retrofitting this isn't actually um, an entirely unachievable All right, hopefully I'll get through the presentation when battery died and the uh, power thing doesn't work. <laughs> um, it's not a huge effort to retrofit this. And actually, as it turns out, it, you know, once you've done it, it wouldn't actually change that often because it covers some of the core functionality around some of the extra features, or like around the fringes and where, where innovation happens, maybe it would. Um, it's actually also valuable for developers and newcomers to the project, right? Um, it's just something which, because normally in open source we don't have to do it, it doesn't happen. If you look at areas like, uh, you know, sort of designs and um, the way how we code, um, that's actually frequently as good or even better than in a proprietary environment. Um, you know, if you look at, typically if you look at process discipline in most open source projects, there's a very strong, you know, discipline, you, you know, like the amount of time we spend on code review typically is a lot more, at least in Xen, is a lot more than, uh, than in a commercial environment. You know, you never actually get anything checked in um, unless, you know, it ticks all the boxes and so on and so forth. What doesn't happen at all is anything to do with traceability. Um, uh, and Unless there's a way to maintain this, you know, if you had to maintain this manually, it would be an absolute nightmare, and that would be just something which would be a red line, you know, which the community wouldn't carry. And then you have the whole thing around testing. You know, obviously, uh, projects have different approaches to testing. Uh, but some of them are better than others, but practically none of them really tests against their requirements, against the architecture specs, and so on. You, test, you write tests against the code. Um, so this side would have to be entirely, you know, probably looked at from scratch, and that's actually the most most expensive part of that entire of that empire, entire problem. So what must be upstream, right? So if you look at what must be upstream to enable that whole cycle, everything on the left side, which is you know your documented requirements, specs, and so on, or the traceability information. That really would need to be all upstream. Otherwise, this whole, you, you know, you can't uh, you can't keep the code and all this stuff in sync. Um, so we started looking at some tools. Um, there's actually no real. There's, there's, there were two open source tools out there, which do anything in this space at all. One is pretty dead, and the other one is it's called Doorstop. Um, uh, it's a little play on doors um, and. Uh, I started playing with this, and it's 
basically works on a concept of storing different pieces of documentation artifacts. There could be requirements, there could be other bits and pieces which you can link together, which are stored in the tree. And so you follow your normal Git workflow, and then when you invalidate it, it actually leads you through the chains to make sure, like, you know, if I change something, a top-level requirement, um, it makes me go and to verify that all the things, you know, which depend on that chain are actually verified and ticked off. It's very similar uh, in many ways to, to how Git works. So that kind of could, it has issues, but it can probably be fixed with a few weeks of development effort in that community. And it's something, um, uh, and they're actually responsive. So I submitted some patches to those guys already, and you know, um, some bugs, and they started, you know, they started being responsive. So that's kind of encouraging. Um, so that means that actually this left side is potentially feasible. Um, the validation side, because it's so expensive, um, it doesn't actually have to be necessarily upstream. The minimum requirement is that if it isn't upstream, it has to be somehow integrated into the project CI infrastructure. And we have examples of projects actually doing this. So if you look at OpenStack, um, OpenStack has this concept of third-party CIs where you know, comp companies like VMware and so on, they can plug into that framework. And then you know, like whenever they release or, or have regular CI builds, you know, if there's failures in a third-party CI, then there's a responsibility on a vendor who supplied it to fix the thing in a certain time upstream because otherwise they get kicked out of the CI you know, infrastructure. So there's, again, there's kind of patterns to deal with this. So it's not something which we would have to entirely invent from scratch. So, how much time have I got? I'm running out of time. So the other really interesting thing is Misra. I'm going to skip off the skip of, skip about this skip this a little bit. So I picked Misra initially because it's. Interestingly, it's one of the hardest community problems that you will need to fix. And that's primarily because the code review process doesn't really lend itself to, um, uh, to review. You, you end up getting, getting tied up too much in, uh, in bike shedding uh, arguments if you're trying to just like to, to submit patches, right? So we tried to do this. We experimented with it. Um, you know, I was really mean. I picked some really hard and controversial um, uh, rules, uh, told some of our contributors, just submit this uh, to the community and let's just see what happens, right? And it was like a really interesting experiment. You know, none of the guys really knew, you know, this was coming. So we had some real life data of what would actually happen in the community context. And what we learned, um, what we learned was fundamentally the key point, the key issue we had with this is really community scalability, right? If you have a lot of very large changes, what you end up with, you know, if you just say, say, say you have a thousand issue, a thousand misratios in your code base which have to be fixed, and it takes two or four, two, two, maybe four hours, you know, to do a review on this, that's like two man years just of review time, right? And Approaching things this way is just not going to scale. So we have to find a different way of, of dealing with this, where we just deal with you know, classes of issues, maybe, and then you know, upstream them that way. But that fundamentally somewhat breaks you know, the, the, the normal code review process. Um, so we're going to have to somehow you know, try and cover most of the common cases, and then just have discussions around the more difficult ones. So. Getting to a credible plan. So basically, what our approach has been is we're going to try to we're going to go down a low customization route. So we're currently investigating the best routes. So this is done by the SIG. I set up. You know, I covered the V model beforehand. We're starting to collaborate with projects like Eliza and Sefer and others. And actually, I think the most important thing about this is really is really we don't quite know yet how quickly and whether we can do this. So we need to trial and iterate and see how, what works and what doesn't. Um, 
to help us you know, build the confidence ourselves that we can do that and that we can overcome some of the community problems. But also, you know, the more we do this, the more we demonstrate to the wider world that we can actually do this and it helps unlock more funding. And that's basically it. So I'm gonna open the floor to some, some questions and then the, the slides are already, um, uh, already published um, if, you, if you want them. Yeah, go ahead. So, 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 because we're a fairly old project, we're not using user stories today. What we, you know, we have a lot of meta information, which are basically, you know, typically what happens is when you send a patch series uh, to the list, you basically, in a cover letter, you have a quite large, you know, justification why you're doing it and how and so on. And usually for large stuff, that's where a lot of the discussion and clarification happens. The problem is, it's on a bloody mailing list and it doesn't end up in Git, and it's in a very unusable format um, um, to mine. Now, one of the things which is actually helping us, I haven't really dwelled on this, but there's a project going on to really take the Xenon ARM core, and you know, it was this, you know, I mentioned before, and it was designed for servers. Um, so we have a number of vendors who who investigate what it would took to really go over that code base and rewrite it, you know, with embedded fully in mind. And that creates us, you know, that creates an opportunity to look at this and also do this, you know, with the safety stuff and the requirements and all this stuff in mind, right? So this is another key part, you know, of that of that puzzle, you know, we're really trying trying to solve. But yes, a lot of information is is there, it's just, you know, it's just in a very inaccessible format. And the same is true in Linux, right? Um, <clears throat> projects like Cephar, you know, which started later, they have, you know, you know, they may have used user stories, you know, on, uh, on, on various tools, um, and it's probably easier to mine those. So we want this to live, you know, this has to live alongside the code, and that also means that, you know, like then, you know, if there are artifacts which are either in the code or, you know, alongside the code, um, linked to each other, um, then of course also we get the joined up history, you know, through Git. Um, that's, yeah. But, but at the end of the day, you know, a lot of the things around basic core functionality, around isolation and all those things, they're fairly well understood, right? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I guess I have time for another question before I get kicked out. Or well, nobody actually is checking time, so we can just, <laughs> can just wait for the next speaker. Any more questions? All right, so I guess I, uh, if you want to find me afterwards, I'll be, I'll be outside. Um, thank you. <laughs>